27, 28, and 29 focus our attention on, I think would have been quick to use this word. This is hopeless. In chapter 27, verse 1, we get to move inside of David's head. We get to hear the conversation that he's speaking to his heart, and David says this to himself. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. And then we move on in the text. In chapter 28, verse 20, we find Saul, and we get this vivid description of him. The text says, Then Saul fell at once full length on the ground, filled with fear, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. So as we look at these three chapters and these two characters in them, these two characters seem like they're in hopeless situations. David can't remain in Israel because Saul is hunting his life and always moving closer to get him. So his only recourse, his only action that he can take is to flee to the land of the Philistines, the arch enemies of Israel. And then here we have Saul, and he is completely overwhelmed by his hopeless situation. Because he cannot find any sort of direction, any sort of comfort or assurance. All that he can do is fall on the ground full length and tremble and quiver with fear. And so, chapters 27, 28, and 29, we have to notice, have a unique structure to them. These chapters are out of order chronologically. And so if you were to take the time and study them closely and carefully and put them on a timeline, the timeline would look different than what we find in these three chapters. And so the text is breaking a strict chronological ordering. The text begins with David and describes his hopeless situation, giving us all of this detail, putting him into a tight spot. And before there can be any resolution for David, the story quickly changes and diverts our attention towards Saul. And then it describes Saul's hopeless situation. And then it moves quickly back to David's hopeless situation. And so the text is doing this flip-flopping sort of action, and it will do this till the end of the book of 1 Samuel. It's going to flip-flop back and forth between David and Saul. And there's a good reason for this, because the text wants us to compare David's hopeless situation to Saul's hopeless situation. Essentially, the the structure of the text is, is preaching to us, saying, hey, reader, Pay attention here. I want you to compare Saul to David, and you have to do this to understand the point of this book. And so that's our task. The sermon is going to follow the flip-flopping action of the text, looking at David, then moving to Saul, moving back to David. And so we're first of all going to look at Saul and David and their hopeless situations. We want to describe them and just spend some time analyzing what's going on there. And then after we describe their hopeless situations, we want to move into a phase of assessment. We want to take a step back and look at what's going on and ask some very simple questions. Is David hopeless? Is Saul hopeless? Why? Why not? And ultimately, we want to ask the question, well, what is the Lord doing in all of this? What is Yahweh up to? So let's start by describing both David and Saul, and we'll start with David. So look at chapter 27, verse 1. We already read it, but it's worth our attention to go and read it again because this sets everything up. And so David has come to the firm conclusion that he can't stay within the borders of Israel anymore. And he can't stay within the borders of Israel anymore because Saul is after him. And Saul, even more, is an unstable man. One minute, Saul is before David weeping and crying. And then the next minute, he's gathering thousands of troops to hunt for David's life. And so David is saying, I need to flee. Listen to David. I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hands. We need to ponder these words for a moment. David's plan here, David's words here reek of desperation. And if we look at them closely, we'll find a couple levels of desperation at work. First, as readers, we need to take notice that David has already tried this maneuver once before. We, we read of this story when, when David took the, the sword of Goliath and went to Goliath's hometown, Gath, and there he showed up and was recognized, and David was scared out of his mind. And so what did David do? He had to fiend madness to escape. He let spittle run down his beard, and he started marking up the gates of the city. And so we read of David's plan here in chapter 27, verse 1, and we say, this has to be a desperate maneuver, because David has already tried this once before and it didn't work. He'd only try it again if you were really 
desperate. Second, we can't forget that the Philistines are who? Who are they? Well, they are the enemies of Israel. These Philistines were the ones raiding the land of Israel, enslaving Israelites, forcing Israel to live in severe and harsh economic situations. And as we think about this, this would have been a terrible look for David. Just imagine Saul's PR team having a field day with David's actions here. Imagine the attack ads. Just just look at David. Look at this man. You see him for who he is now. He is a traitor. Where does he go when he is in trouble? Oh, he goes to Achish, the king of Gath, our enemy. You just picture the billboards. You could see Achish and, and Saul sitting next to each other, reclining, and you could plaster those all over Israel. And so only desperation would force David to, to run to the enemies because this could end his claim to the throne. And so David makes this move, and it speaks of hopelessness. But as we follow the story, initially it seems that this decision is going to work out well for David. Achish receives David, that's amazing, and his 600 men and their family. So imagine a troop of about 2,000 people moving over to Philistine territory with David. And then Achish gives David a city, Ziklag, and gives him freedom to maneuver around. And at this point, the text wants us to, to focus our attention on what David is doing while he's among the Philistines. David is a raider, and so he's moving from town to town, settlement to settlement, raiding and conquering and plundering. Chapter 28, verse 9 says this, David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the ox, and the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. This is a particularly violent phase of David's life. And then we move down to the next verse, and we get this interesting piece of information The text says, And David and his men went up and made raids against the the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old. So what's going on here? David is moving around from town to town, sacking them, killing everyone, taking their goods, and he's doing it to the the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. What's going on here? Well, there are no throwaway words in Scripture. So if you go back to Joshua chapter 13 and you read there, you find that in the conquest, so Israel was given a land, and they had to go in and conquer the land and push out the inhabitants of the land, that there were still parts of the land that were conquered or ruled by enemies. And so what is David doing here? We find him completing the conquest while he's in exile. And here we get a glorious picture of David. Even when he's in exile, he's doing good for Israel once again, conquering unconquered territory. Now back to the story. All of this activity by David made Achish a rather happy king. Every raid that David succeeded in enriched Achish because David would bring back tribute and give it to the the king. Even more, Achish thought all of David's actions We're moving him more firmly and more firmly into his own arms of control. You see that David was running a ruse here. David was attacking Israel's enemies, and he was telling uh, Achish that he was, in fact, attacking the people of Israel in the southernmost parts of Judah. And so David is running this ruse, and his deception works. Chapter 27, verse 12 puts it like this. Achish trusted David, or Achish believed David, thinking... He had made himself an utter stench to his people. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. What is Achish saying? I own David forever. But here's the problem for David. David's deception worked too well. So trusted was David that when it was time to make war against Israel, who does Achish call upon? It says, David, come with me. And not only does he call upon David, but he makes him his bodyguard for life, literally the, the keeper of his head. David has a preeminent position in Achish's army. So we have to think this through. All of this is putting David in a a hopeless spot. And so David was hopeless in the land of Israel because Saul was pursuing him, and so he fled to the land of the Philistines. And now in the land of the Philistines, after a bit of rest, he's plunged into a greater spot of hopelessness. You have to feel the pinch. On the one hand, if David rebels against Achish, and doesn't fight against Israel, certainly his life will be over. Achish will kill him. But on the other hand, if he obeys Achish and he goes and he wages war against the very people of God, I mean, that's not even an option for David. And so we're left here as readers. What is David going to do? But before we get an answer, 
Before the text resolves this problem, the story changes direction. You have to love how the Bible works. It, it doesn't give us an answer. It quickly changes our direction and moves us to look at Saul. So the Philistines have put David in a dilemma, and the Philistines also put Saul in a dilemma. And so if you look at the beginning of chapter 28 and at the beginning of chapter 9, the text gives us some geographical data. And so from the data, we can piece together what seems to be the strategy of the Philistines. It seems that they're, they're pushing into the middle of Israel, trying to, to separate the north from the south, trying to cut it off. And so this movement and strategy of the Philistines had an effect upon Saul. Look at chapter 28, verse 5. The text says, When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. So this is a theme in the book of 1 Samuel. Saul's fear grows throughout the narrative. At every scene, his fear is growing and growing and growing. And now here with the Philistines before him, his fear has seized him, and his heart is trembling and quaking. But we need to keep reading because as we keep reading, we realize that Saul's problem is bigger than just the Philistines. Verse 6, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So what is the text saying? We can think of a, a faucet. And what has the Lord done? He's closed off the faucet. No revelation for Saul. No direction, no comfort, no assurance, no presence. Just complete and utter silence from Yahweh. Saul's in a predicament. Philistines before him. Yahweh's not speaking to him. So what does Saul do? Well, he is desperate for a word, any sort of word. He's desperate for direction, any sort of direction. He's desperate for comfort, any sort of comfort. So what does he do? He calls for a medium. He calls for a witch. And so Saul strips himself, and this is a flurry of activity. He strips himself of his kingly robes. And he puts on a, a disguise, and then he heads off behind enemy territory and travels to Endor to meet a witch there. And Saul has to persuade the witch, and ironically, Saul has to swear by the name of the Lord that he will, in fact, break the law of the Lord. And after that, the woman conjures up for Saul, Samuel. Now, we have to resist the temptation here to speculate about witchcraft and how it works and what's going on exactly in the text, because the text doesn't really care about it. The text cares about this conversation between Samuel and Saul, and so we need to listen to it. And so Samuel is awake, and he is not happy to be awake. And so he demands to know why he's been awakened, and so Saul explains. 28 verse 15, Saul says, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more. So Samuel turns to him, and he begins to speak, and Samuel's words are chilling. He offers no comfort, no hope, no assurance. Verse 16, Samuel says, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and has become your enemy? And then Samuel goes on in verse 17 and verse 18 and explains the context for why this is happening. He disobeyed the word of the Lord, and the Lord has purposed to, to pull the kingdom away, to tear the kingdom away from Saul. And then in verse 19, Samuel does give Saul direction, but it's not the direction that Saul wanted. Samuel says, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And so Samuel is dead, and even when Samuel is dead, his words are powerful, and what do they do? They slay Saul in the moment. Saul falls over on the floor full length, and he is seized by fear and trembling. And so we've described both David and Saul and their hopeless situations. And so we need to do the work of assessment. What are we to make of these hopeless situations? David has been pushed out of the promised land, away from the presence of the Lord, and now he's living with the Philistines, and living with the Philistines have only made matters worse. He's between this rock and a hard place. And then there's Saul. He's completely shut off from the Lord. He's terrified. He's reduced to lying flat on the floor. He's exhausted all alone. What are we to make of these situations? Well, we need to give assessment to both David's and Saul's situations. And we have to say, this is a really hard work to do. It's really hard to judge Saul's situation and David's situation. And it's hard to judge our own hopeless situations. 
And why? Because it's, it's hard because our vision of reality is limited and oftentimes our, our vision of reality is, is faulty. Just think about your own life. Sometimes we get into a pessimistic funk. You've been there and it seems like everything is hopeless. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all hopeless. There could even be a remedy, a solution right next to you, but you can't see it because you're in the fog of pessimism. But sometimes we think everything is okay. Everything is going well when actually it's not. We're whistling away at our work, and instead we should be doing what? We should be saying our last prayers. So how do, we, how do we give an assessment of David's life, of Saul's life? How do we give an assessment of our own lives? Well, we have to pay attention to the word of Scripture because the Lord defines what is hopeless and what isn't hopeless. And so let's look at Saul. What are we to make of his situation? Well, we find Saul lying flat on the floor. He's prostrate. He's shaking with fear. He's completely exhausted and overcome with fatigue. He's got nothing left. Here's a picture of a man completely drained by life. And clearly, we can say that Saul believes his situation is hopeless. His body speaks it. His mouth doesn't even have to move. But here's the question. Is Saul right? Is Saul right? Is he actually hopeless? Well, the answer is straightforward. Saul is right. Saul's situation is hopeless. And as we let that settle on it, and it just comes out of our mouth, that just, it doesn't sound right, does it? Saul's situation is hopeless. Saul has no hope, no future for him. We have to get some clarity about that. What does that actually mean for Saul to have no hope? Well, we've got to probe the text. I want to ask three questions. First question is this, what is it that makes Saul's situation hopeless? We have to be clear here because sometimes we can get wrong about what hopelessness is. It's not the exhaustion that Saul is experiencing or the fear, the uncontrollable trembling. It's not him lying flat on the floor in the witch's house like a dead man. No, we have to be clear. Emotions come and go in life. Even severe and debilitating ones come and go in life, and they don't make us ultimately hopeless. Nor is it the Philistines. Just like emotions, tough and challenging circumstances come and go. And they've come and gone for Saul throughout his ministry to Israel. He has faced situations that have made him tremble, and he has faced situations that he's done well. Remember Nahash, the Ammonite. Saul faced him and won. So we have to go deeper. What is it that makes Saul's situation hopeless? Well, listen to what Saul says. Chapter 28, verse 15. He says, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more. What's the situation here? God has turned from Saul, and Saul is aware of it. And it gets clearer when we listen to Samuel talk to, to Saul in verse 16. Samuel says, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? What's the issue here? What's the, what's the very center of this hopelessness for Saul? It's this theological reality that Saul is without God even more. As Samuel speaks, Yahweh has become the enemy of Saul. Yahweh himself is warring against this king. And Samuel's words just chill us. And so we want to ask another question, don't we? Why has the Lord become Saul's enemy? Why has this happened? We have to be clear, the Lord is not unstable or fickle. He doesn't change on a whim. He is both righteous and wise and good. There has to be some reason why the Lord has become Saul's adversary. Well, the answer is right there in the text. Saul refused to listen to Yahweh. Listen to what Samuel says in chapter 28, verse 18. Samuel says, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord. Why is all of this happening? Because Saul turned away from Yahweh. And we have to understand the nature of this refusal. While Samuel points to this one incident with Amalek, it's, it's a bigger issue for Saul's life. It's Saul's whole life from his ascension to the battle with Amalek to his treatment of David. The whole story of Saul is a refusal of Yahweh's word. Saul refused to relent. He refused to stop obeying. And so what did the Lord do? He, return, he turned against this king. In fact, we see that work in this very chapter, in chapter 28. What is Saul doing? Instead of repenting and crying out for mercy and grace because he knows that Yahweh has turned from him, what does Saul do? Well, he despises the word of the Lord and actually swears by the Lord's name as he goes to a witch and calls for the witch to bring some sort of revelation to him. 
And so this brings a third question. Well, what are we supposed to do with this? I'm seeing it's dark and it's harsh and it's uncomfortable. There is no way you can cozy up to Saul in chapter 28. The scene unnerves us, it unsettles us, it troubles us. Here we see Saul, he's in the house of a witch at night, a man without a comfort in the world, a man without a single hope, a man living in complete and utter darkness. And what is the text telling us? It's saying this, Saul did this to himself because he refused the word of the Lord and refused it again and again and again, hardening his heart against Yahweh. We have to see here, this is why the Old Testament is so good for us. It's so good for us. It doesn't just give us propositional truth, but it forms the truth in such a concrete fashion through story and example that we can't ignore the truth about God. What's going on here? Well, chapter 28 is creeping into our minds and it's taking control of our imaginations. In the life of Saul, we see and we do not only see, but we, we feel just how hazardous it is to turn away from Yahweh our God. And then to experience the just hostility of this God. You see what the chapter is doing. It's it's ushering us into the darkness, shaking us up and unsettling us. And so what are we supposed to do with this chapter? Well, we need to receive its teaching, and we receive its teaching by doing this, fearing the Lord our God and obeying His Word. Psalm 95 says this, Today, if you hear His voice... Do not harden your heart. What is the psalmist saying? When you hear the voice of the Lord, do not resist it, but obey it quickly and joyfully. So that's Saul. We can ask, well, what about, what about David? What about David? What about his situation? Well, we left him at the beginning of chapter 28, and there he is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Is he going to serve Achish? By entering into war, or is he going to rebel and probably die at the hands of the Philistines, he and all of his family? Just consider the situation again. David was in one hopeless situation in Israel. He fled from Israel. He moved to the land of the Philistines, and then another hopeless situation, but double. So what are we to make of David's situation? Is it hopeless? Well, we find an answer in chapter 29. So in chapter 29, the Philistines prepare for battle, and we find some sort of troop inspection as they're staging to get ready to go out. And so Achish and his men, as David in tow, pass by the, the Philistine lords, and the Philistine lords take notice of David, and they're, they're not pleased by this. They've heard the song, Saul has struck down his thousands, but David his ten thousands. They've heard the reports, they know David's renown. He's a great warrior for Israel. And so they say that David has to leave because they do not want him in the battle in case that he turns against them. And so what happens here in chapter 29? We find out that David's situation is not hopeless. David finds salvation, and he finds salvation from the most unlikely source, from the Philistines themselves. David is not hopeless. So we want to probe this too. We ask questions about Saul's situation, now we need to ask questions about David's situation. Why isn't David's situation hopeless? Perhaps we might be tempted to point towards David. He is a crafty man. We've seen his his craft and his wile throughout the narrative. He's a tricky guy. But look at the text. He is passive in this episode. He isn't doing anything actively. He's just responding and receiving, and all that he does is receive this salvation from the Lord. Or we might point to luck or good fortune. Wow, that was just in the nick of time that the the Philistines caught David there and told him that he had to move on. But but we've been in 1 Samuel too long to settle with that answer because we know that Yahweh is the sovereign God. So why isn't David's situation hopeless? Well, the answer is short and simple and good. The Lord was with David. Once again, we see here that Yahweh, the sovereign God, orchestrated David's salvation and he rescued him. He rescued him. So we ask, well, what are we supposed to do with this? What are we supposed to do with this? How does this make sense for us? Well, I believe that this scene and the way it's set up, it moves from David's predicament to David's salvation, drives us straight towards gospel truth. And so brothers and sisters, hear this and believe this with all of your heart. If you are in Christ Jesus today, the word hopeless does not apply to you. Just hear that truth, because that is true for you. If you are in Christ Jesus, the word hopeless does not apply to your life. 
You are not hopeless. That's glorious. That's life-changing. We get to remove that word from our vocabulary because we're in Jesus. Now, it's one thing to say that, but it's an altogether different thing to believe that and actually live like that's actually true for us. In our lives, we're pressed into all sorts of situations, just like David's. And it takes different shapes and forms throughout our lives. For some of us, it means that our our bodies are starting to fall apart. They don't work the way they were supposed to. But even worse, our bodies begin to punish us and inflict pain on us. And it seems like we're trapped inside of them. And we're tempted to say when we're in those moments that this is hopeless. For others, it's the life of the mind and it's our souls and how they're dysfunctional. Unwanted thoughts and suggestions assault us. Anxiety out of nowhere rushes upon us and won't leave us. Clouds of gloom roll in and no light can break in and we can't see anything. We can go on, can't we? Relationships, broken ones. It's like you're in a room and there's just broken glass everywhere and where you walk, you just get cut and you get cut and you get cut. Or just life in general. You thought a career was going to provide some hope for you, but all of a sudden you're just in a dead end. And it shouldn't be miserable to you, but it is miserable to you. It just grinds on you. And so what are we supposed to do in all of this? What does the gospel do for us in all of this? Is there anything for us in the midst of these circumstances? What David's story does is it trains us on how to apply the word of the gospel to our hearts because we see in David's life that there was a superior word. There was a more, more powerful word that was governing over his life. He was not governed by his circumstances. He was rather governed by the truth of the gospel that Yahweh was for him. And so what do we do in our hopeless or what seems like our hopeless situations? But we do this, being trained by the story. We grab hold of the word of the gospel and we believe it with all of our hearts. And we do this because we have come to know the gospel word is more true and more sure and more reliable than whatever we feel or see or experience. We've come to know that the gospel speaks a superior word, a word that controls all things and reigns over all things, even troubles and pressures and suffering. It's the gospel word that rules our lives. It's for this reason that God has designed his book in a very specific way. Wherever you turn in the book, you find the gospel word being spoken, whether it's in 1 Samuel or in Matthew or in the Psalms, you find the gospel word being repeated again and again and again. Why? Because we forget. We forget. We believe our circumstances and we say to ourselves, self, you are hopeless. But the word of the gospel comes to us and it takes control and it says, God is for you. It speaks a powerful word, and it says, your sins are forgiven, all of them, not one of them is held against you if you are in Christ Jesus. It says this beautiful thing, your life, it is hidden in Christ, in God. It keeps going on. It says there's hope for you. Why? Because you're a child of God. You're an heir of new creation. You shall reign with Jesus over all things soon. You shall share in the resurrection the fullness of it, and you shall soon be wrapped up and covered over in glory upon glory upon glory. That's what the gospel word keeps speaking to us again and again and again. And it's only that word that breaks into our seemingly hopeless situations. This is what David's story is training us for. We see it at work in David's life. If we just look at his circumstances, it seems seems hopeless. But then we find the word of the gospel at work. Yahweh is for David. And that's how we have to learn to read our own lives. The Lord is for me in Christ Jesus forever. And so here's the question that stands before us. Will you take hold of the word of the gospel and will you believe it with all of your heart? Will you do that? Will you take hold of the word of the gospel and believe it with all of your heart? 